Real quick, guys, before we get started on this interview, I had a technical difficulty on my end on this interview, so that's why my particular video is going to look a little choppy at times, but the guy I'm interviewing, Steve Matley, his is fine and the audio is fine, but just want to let you guys know about that real quick before the, we start the interview. What's going on, everyone? Today I'm here with Steve Matley from, with smdiversity.com. He's out of Seattle, and he definitely fights for diversity and inclusion. Steve, thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you. All right. Hi, I'm here. I'm, uh, thank you so much, Bill. Well, Steve, how did you get involved with diversity and inclusion work? Um, personally, I got involved because I, I am a, a, a person uh, that identifies from that community. Uh, you know, just in short, uh, having uh, grown up in a uh, low income, underserved, uh, area here in Seattle. I grew up in the south side of Seattle, uh, Holly Park uh, Housing Authority, a single mother, uh, and we were uh, reliant on the public assistance, uh, whether that be, you know, with health healthcare, uh, food banks, welfare, um, and, you know, attending a, a, a high school where there was a 60% plus dropout rate uh, the lack of mentors and resources that are available to to myself and my own journey um, as as a as a teen uh, growing up and, and trying to transition into uh, uh, as a professional in, in corporate America it was it was a very difficult journey yet alone into um, college and so having that personal uh, experience uh, I wanted to make sure that you know as I um, gained more knowledge and experience and uh, leverage within my own professional journey to be able to pay that forward by giving back to the communities uh, that we serve. Uh, so, you know, in short, personally is what drove me to do this professionally. And I've been um, fortunate enough to have a, a pretty healthy career. Uh, this is my second business. Uh, first business was in early 2000. I was uh, uh, CEO and partner of a mortgage brokerage uh, firm, which we grew to about 30 plus employees with three office buildings uh, with less than $5,000 capital startup. Uh, more recently, three years ago, I decided to again uh, venture back into entrepreneurship and I currently serve as a CEO and founder of SM Diversity, which is a boutique um, staffing agency, staffing and recruiting agency that has a focus on uh, diversity and inclusion programs. Uh, we basically help companies meet the demands of trying to connect to a more broader, diverse network of uh, professionals. Uh, and we do this through workshops, events, uh, subject matter experts around diversity and inclusion, uh, shared activities, uh, professional uh, meetups, and simply in short connecting and being that bridge between companies and communities and for making sure that those opportunities to uh, work with these companies are presented to uh, communities that you know rarely ever get get these opportunities to even uh, participate so that's that's kind of our our value and, and, and goals and mission and, and, and impact that we're looking to uh, make more and more so you have a state like Washington that does not have affirmative action, and I don't understand right. why they don't have that. Now, a state that ha that doesn't have affirmative action, um, do you notice more people, let's say within the black community, let's say Asian, Hispanic, et cetera, uh, do you right. see them being cut out of jobs a lot more than you say than a state would, that do have affirmative action? Uh, you know, that's a good, that's a good question uh, because there's a couple – conversations around that. Um, you know, some people have asked, you know, well, is affirmative action, has that really been effective? And who were the benefit benefiters of um, affirmative action, right? And apparently from what I'm understanding is white women were uh, the ones that were uh, the benefactors of affirmative action. Um, I can't say why or why we shouldn't because I don't know too much about um, how companies on a compliance level can do that. I will say that basically in my experience around HR and recruiting, we're talking more about competitive advantages and business strategies versus compliance. 
because you know compliance have, has been around for uh, uh, quite a, a few years now, right? In in most states, uh, I want to say EEOC um, has been around since what the the seventies. Mm -hmm. Just don't let that be started. Um, just so that way I can make sure I have accurate facts. Uh, but it was founded in 1965. Uh, is, is Around the time of the Civil Rights Movement. Correct, correct. And, and, and you know, uh, in the words of, of FNS Henderson, who's the Chief Diversity Officer for Warehouser of 40 years and served on the Society of Human Resource uh, Task Force for Diversity, and actually somebody that I consider a, a mentor uh, to myself in DNI. You know, he, he, he's asked in, in a room of, of HR generalists, he said uh, at a symposium one time, he said, hey, how many of you feel that uh, the diversity is a responsibility that all of us are, you know, must partake in and, 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 and be accountable or, you know, be responsible for? And, and everyone raised their hand and he goes, OK, out of, out of everyone that raised their hand, if there is no diversity that happens, then who's accountable? And you know, a lot of hands were, were put down, and, and that and that kind of signals a couple things for me. Um, one uh, is accountability going to help us progress it because if you think about it, accountability has really still hasn't been able to trickle down to where you, those are still showing in the numbers because in the tech industry, especially. Uh, regardless of the EEOC, one to four percent of black and, and brown exists in, 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 tech, in tech companies today. And, and, and that's kind of the scary norm, as it seems. And so, you know, does compliance really drive the true inclusive behavior once that happens? Um, I, I don't know, because a, a lot of this stuff is still theory. A lot of it is still groundbreaking research. Um, Veronica Finch, who's the Global Diversity uh, and Inclusion for uh, Microsoft on a panel even once said, you know, we've been trying to do the right things for 20 plus years. Where has that gotten us? Um, so I, I almost challenge it to the fact that maybe we should look at that in a different way that, you know, compliance is one way to look at it. But competitive advantage is, is, is also a different way to um, shift our focus. And when I say competitive advantage, I mean being more proactive because reactive is just basically trying to avoid lawsuits, just doing just enough, just to, just to, just to meet that compliance or just to have those goals, to have those numbers, right? Versus how can we really, really connect and engage with communities? Because compliance still, when you do a compliance and you have the diversity, when they go out and do these studies on workforce engagement, 80% of the workforce is still feeling disengaged. So as many black and brown people we can get into a company, um, if they're not engaged and feel included and they, they belong and they can bring their whole self to the organization, we're still gonna keep going down this whole revolving door of let's bring black people, let's bring uh, 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 Asian people, let's bring Hispanics, Latinos, let's bring women into the workplace, but we're just you know swinging them right off uh, out the door. Uh, because of compliance, right? Um, you know, my, my theory is that we could watch a video on unconscious bias, we could watch a video on sexual harassment, but does that compliance uh, method really actually truly work? Um, or is it, or, or should we start looking at more of like engagement, exposure therapy, um, shared activities, cultural awareness, uh, act, you know, um, uh, different types of training that we can introduce, uh, employee resource groups, mentor, mentee uh, uh, programs that companies can start implementing, different sourcing uh, 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 strategies that, that recruiters should be accountable for. Um, so those are, those are my methods of how I look uh, in, into the HR realm, workforce, you know, planning, strategy, organizational behavior, um, a psychological safety, right? And also mm -hmm. just saying, hey, Biases exist. It's human based. It's human bias. Uh, how do we disrupt those biases that exist? Because implicit, you know, bias and, and 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 studies have shown that we all have biases, and there's just no way that we can uh, just completely be colorblind, right? Uh, I, I I I I'm more of in the approach of let's embrace it. Let's embrace 
the differences. Let's embrace the the different ethnicities and the cultures that are that are available out there. And how do we um, uh, uh, address those? How do we make it warm and welcoming? How do we attract that? How do we retain that? And how do we use our current uh, uh, work workplace um, um, employees, voice of the employee, to attract more of what's underrepresented? So you know, one of the things that I, I've been doing a lot, Phil, is is going around and coaching and, and, and I hate to use the word consulting, but being a resource to a lot of organizations, particularly tech right now, because they kind of have the biggest fires um, around how can we change the current norms or status quo of just doing enough, just being compliant, just you know satisfying federal uh, uh, compliances, and really being authentic, genuine, um, engaged, and, and, and seeing the probability, uh, the innovation, the creativity, the, 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 the sense of belonging that employees are gonna feel um, through these different holistic, multifaceted approach. Um, and I know that's a lot that I've been, I've been talking about, but you know, it's almost like it feels almost like research and development. And there's really no one way that works and one way that works for all organizations across industries. Um, do I believe affirmative action has its place? I absolutely do. I think that there's got to be legal ramifications for those that don't meet a certain um, uh, number when they're getting uh, certain money. But what I mean by that is I'll use, for example, uh, Planeteer, which is a Peter Thiel founded company, and one of the one of the uh, uh, claims um, from uh, you know the audits was, were, were that they were uh, you know uh, how do, what's the word uh, directly discriminating uh, Asian candidates that were applying. They mm -hmm. were uh, and I and, you know don't quote me on this number. But there's research and there's links on this, but. Out of say a thousand Asian candidates, they only hired two, and apparently they hired eight uh, white males uh, in, in their interview loops, and they couldn't have they they, they they didn't show a standard or structured interview loop of how they made these decisions to disqualify very qualified candidates, um, and they were warned twice on their practices and the behaviors and the discrimination that that uh, was blatant. Um, and so, you know, it, it sounds like they got a hand slap. I didn't look too much into it, but I read a little bit about the article. And it, this was during the time when, you know, Donald Trump was just getting, getting ready to get elected and, and Peter Thiel came out and um, uh, uh, made his stance that he's, you know, a, a strong supporter of the Trump administration, um, which is interesting, you know, uh, how that all correlates. Um, so, you know, Phil, I hope that answers your question is that, um, I can't speak in depth about affirmative action because that's not my area of expertise, but, but I can't speak in depth about the competitive nature and business strategies that uh, I feel that companies, once they move and see, um, you know, how that benefits other organizations, um, that is where the focus should shift to is how do we make this a competitive business strategy uh, and, and expose more companies to uh, the talent that is available that they're overlooking because of the biases that exist in our hiring practices. Well, you know, the thing you saw earlier about affirmative action. Yes, that's true. Um, white women is the biggest benefactor of affirmative action. That's why it actually stay around, believe it or not. But you know, the thing is you were speaking about these companies. First of all, I feel it's sad that you have to actually do something called diversity and inclusion. Um, but right. the thing for me, is you have to include people on purpose because in this country they have a thing called the good old boy system and the good old boy oh, yeah. system take care of white males for the most part that's why you say when you heard about all the white males as they hired versus the asian uh people they did not hire or only two out of a thousand and it's just as worse with uh us in the melanated community because you know they look at asian people uh, a little bit better than look at us in the racial hierarchy in this country. It has nothing to do with you personally, but it's just how the system of Caucasian supremacy right. operates. Um, right. But while stating is you have to be include people on purpose, and unfortunately, 
that's not the way they think in this country. And so that's why they say, oh, we can't include, we don't know what's them to tell you something. If I, or even you say, okay, I am going to hire, um, you know, I want to hire black men, black women. I want 20% of my workforce to be black. So I still have the same requirements. I'm not lessening my requirements to get the job, but I'm on purpose is going to look for those people. You have to do it on purpose. Correct. Uh, you know what? I love what you just said there, Phil, on our new business cards, and, I, and it's probably looking backwards, but it reads, if we don't consciously include, we will unconsciously exclude. And so I've been going around letting, you see, <laughs> And I'm going to let my hair down a little bit, but uh, you see what's going on, Phil, is white males uh, in tech today will feel, and they've actually done studies about this, that they're the ones that are being oppressed uh, because of these programs, and they feel like they're left out of the, of the conversation. Um, you know, I, I, I remember going to the... To the um, uh, Air, Air, uh, Army uh, Army base here, uh, JBLM, Joint Base Lewis McCord, and we do we do these events with transitioning service women, and in the restroom, uh, a gentleman, uh, 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 a gentleman came up to me and said, "Hey, um, what what event are you doing here?" And I said, uh, "Oh, it's you know for transitioning service women." He goes, "Oh, that's cool. What about us guys? Why why is it got to be only women?" And, you know, I thought about that for a second. That, that almost reminds me of some of the things that, you know, when I'm in these conferences talking about the benefits of employee resource groups and why that is, you know, associated to people's bottom lines and why they should consider creating an employee resource group. I don't care how big or small you are. Um, but uh, somebody said, well, what about like, you know, how come they don't have a, uh, 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 an employee resource group for whites? And I was like, well, you know, you really think about it. The biggest employee resource groups are for white males, and they have been happening. And that—that that is what you—what you just alluded to was the Good Old Boys Club. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this is exactly what's been happening. The reason why tech has 70, 80 percent white males is because of the employee resource groups and what that generates. So I actually turned it around and said, hey, look, I will give you the benefit of saying that. You're not a racist. You're not prejudiced. You're not biased. Let's just say we put that out there. Let's just say, you know, um, so that way it's it's um, it's warm and fuzzy, right? And and people will say, you know, I'm not privileged or whatever. Let's just say that 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 that, that, that that's the case. Um, I had a point to this, <laughs> but you know, I, I, basically what the way I look at it is. We're not saying that you're that there's going to be anything that's going to be taken away from you. What we're saying is make it equitable instead of relying on just this whole notion of meritocracy. Um, that you know, going back to the Rooney Rule, somebody might say, "Well, we just hire the best talent." Well, how are you defining the best talent? You know, what is your selection process of that best talent look like? Right. And so a lot of companies are, are saying, well, you know, we just hire the best talent. Well, the, the best talent is based on your own personal network. So let's just say there's nothing sinister. That's, that's the point that I was going to make was as long as you can make people feel comfortable and give them the benefit of the doubt, because there are white allies and we will need them because they are the ones that are in the majority of these companies. Um, is if, Let's just say for a second there that white males in tech unintentionally just happen up continuously because of the referral programs, about 60, 70% of jobs uh, are filled based on a referral program. So that's what we call a hidden job market. Because if I'm a white male and 67% of my roles in my industry or my company are filled by my own network, well, that's what you call a homogenous um, uh, in, uh, uh, environment. And, and, and let's just say there's nothing sinister about it. It's not that I wasn't trying to not hire black people. It's just that I wasn't intentional about hiring black people. Do you kind of follow me there, Phil? So this kind of goes back to you about saying, you know, if, if we're trying to hire more black and brown, you gotta be more intentional. You gotta do it on purpose. 
Let's just say for a second there that white males say, hey, or the person from Amazon, uh, a hiring manager of over 50 says, you know what, I don't think about diversity. And rather than me be off offended, I wrote it off as maybe he's just ignorant. Maybe he doesn't know enough. And maybe, you know what, unconsciously, he can mean really well and be a great person but he just doesn't understand yet. Nobody's ever introduced him to diversity 101 and the business benefits of why diversity is gonna help his workforce, his organization, him as a team, um, his customers, his profitability. And these are facts. These aren't my opinion of, oh, diversity is a good thing. No, diversity is a great business thing on top of that. If anything, that's the most important factor. You know, uh, a Facebook manager at one time has, has told me when I told him about diversity is, he goes, well, you know, we have a high bar. I said, that's interesting that you would bring up just a high bar when I talk about diversity. Like, why, why, why are we talking about a higher bar? Did I ask you to lower the bar? Because if anything, studies have shown that people of color will actually raise your bar and increase your bottom line. Um, so let's not talk about the bar because we raised the bar. You see, it's more about being intentional, but being aware. And because of what people currently associate the bias that we have, diversity too, um, that can trigger a lot of feelings or behaviors based on those feelings, whether it's more or lack of. I think it has to start with one, taking a snapshot of the current workplace. So, if, you know, the advice show was a company, I would advise, pun intended, uh, that um, advice looks within their current workplace and get a snapshot of the feeling, the climate, of what the values are, defining that values as a company. And companies are made of people, and based on those people's feelings, the current workplace, a snapshot, and then taking a look at what is underutilized. And a lot, if this was a tech company, a lot of what you'll find out is the underutilization of an underrepresentation of black and brown or advancement of black and brown. Because I've heard, you know, people talk about how diversity is not a problem in their company. They're just fine. Okay, well, let's talk about the advancement. Let's talk about what does diversity mean to you? Because I've heard people say, well, we have good diversity. And I said, okay, well, then how many black and brown people that you, do, do you have working there? What is your definition of diversity? You know, and how does that you know, tie into your business functions, your creation process, your sales team? Is there more representation and selective diversity that's happening? Like are all the women that are working in your organization just in HR and you know, we have enough diversity here? Or are you Amazon and most of the black and brown that is in your company are more in the warehouse versus in leadership or on the board or in management and what does that rate look like? Uh, so these are things that we have to consider um, when we're talking about diversity because it's such a big loaded question and it goes across organizations and the different biases that exist within different groups of the organizations and the intentionality and the manager's behaviors and what is what is what is it? What is their level of diversity intelligence? Right? I call it BIQ. How much are they aware of what their actions or the lack of their actions and oh. understanding of the or, or or not for the organization? So let's just look at diversity as if you were a sales organization, a growing, scaling sales organization, and you knew everything. Let's just say you knew how to cold call, you knew how to do the follow ups, you knew all the systems, but maybe you didn't know how to. Um, take somebody from you know college and grow their career year over year professional development and you had to go to a professional development Dale Carnegie training course the same investments that you make in your organization to send a sales professional to a Dale Carnegie course so that way they can come back out and say hey I have these formulas on you know how to qualify a, 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 a client um, how to respond to you know hostile behavior I mean these are just tools and training that you have to intentionally work on and invest into your work, workplace, there's no different in, in, in diversity and inclusion training. There's none. I mean, I took the Cornell University program because I, I personally wanted to commit myself and be intentional about my growth. And so when I took that training, one of the things that I learned from that program was, wow, 
engagement and inclusion has a root cause, and that's called psychological safety. What does that mean? How do you tackle that? What is the solution? So, you know, expanding that research out. Well, you so know, I think, I, 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 go ahead. Sorry. I, yeah, and, and, I'll, and I'll leave it off with this. I, I, I'll say this. The more and more we could get into the deeper roots of the heart condition of why people have certain triggers and associate certain things, because if you and I sat here and said Black Lives Matter, it could be a totally different meaning for us than it is for the next person. And based on that meaning, the behaviors and the association that comes with it could be either negative or positive. And based on that, it's gonna be based on my actions or inactions or how I respond to it. And I think that when people get a better understanding of what diversity and inclusion is and what the benefits are that other companies are having that you're not seeing or that you're not understanding or exposing you to communities, that's why we have, you know, it's, it's, that's why we have Islamophobia, homophobia, is because people don't know, don't understand or don't know enough or don't associate with them on a personal level. So how do we expect them to do it on a professional level? See, I have this, this theory about a micro and macro. If everything that's going on around the world on a micro level is playing out to show America, we as Americans don't understand enough about each other. And that fear and the psychological safety and the lack of exposure or engagement with one another is causing that. And that's why we continue to build more bridges than we do, I mean, sorry, build more walls than we do bridges. How do we tackle that? Well, we tackle that by having uh, workshops, events, consultants, um, community partners, different practitioners that are talking about their best practices to create better practices. So there's so many multiple angles that I'm, I'm a part of and that I'm around. And I almost, and I hate to use the word cancer, but I say cancer because cancer is something that we're all still trying to solve. And nobody has solved cancer yet, but does that mean we stop doing the research? No, we continue to invest in the research because we know that cancer exists. We know there are behaviors that create the cancer and we wanna continue to research on different solutions and, and trials and studies and then share and come together and say, what did you do that worked? And that's why we have what they call the Hack Diversity Workshop and a Hack Diversity and Inclusion Workshop where for the first time, companies from different industries, leaders, community leaders, thought leaders are coming together and becoming thinking partners um, in, a, in a safe environment because maybe they, 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 they don't have that psychologically safe, uh, safe in, in workplace that allows for those types of conversations and dialogues to happen. So we create an instance where they can come together. So you'll have Boeing sit next to Microsoft, they sit next to Google, sit next to Amazon, sit next to uh, uh, leaders from, you know, uh, Society of Human, uh, or National Society of Hispanic MBA, so the National Association of Asian American Professionals, to here Seattle, which is a uh, predominantly African-American uh, male, female, tech and creative meetup group of professionals that have ballooned to over a thousand members. You know, when you put everyone in a room and you have the diversity and you give everyone a voice at the table and make them feel that their voice is heard and that they can bring their whole self, you, you would be surprised what comes out of that. And rather than complain about how it's not happening, we went to go create it. Rather than complaining that we don't know enough organizations, we went to go seek them out. Rather than complaining that they don't have these types of meetup groups, we created those meetup groups. And that's what we're offering to companies is this holistic approach, this research, this development, that these partners, this ecosystem, and identifying different gaps in their organization. But before you can do that, you have to start with a diagnostic and then and then move towards a solution based and create and, and, and actually include them in that in that creation process. So Steve, you know, I, I know that's a long way of throwing it all on the table, but that 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 these are the things that happened in in the last few years. What I've immersed myself in. Well, Steve, you know, like I said, and, and I'm going to say this with the 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 very very utmost respect to you, but you you know what's going on, which what, what you describing to me is something that's very overthought. It sounds very good too that you put together. But for me, everything you just said is classic white supremacy. And I'm going to tell you why it's classic. The white male told you that what about white males? Now, the whole system is created for them as it is. 
So yeah, why? Yeah. So when they yeah. when they told you at Facebook, well, you know, we have a high standard. They just basically told you that black people, whoever people you describing at the time, they're not going to meet our standards because you didn't mention education. You didn't mention where they went to school from. None of that yeah. automatically. Yeah. They looked at people um underneath them who are white automatically you ask the other person say you ever think about it no the reason why they don't think about it is because they don't think about other groups of people but themselves so when they look at these jobs and say we're being oppressed no what that means is i cannot stand that hispanic that asian that white woman that uh melanated man or woman to have that 70 80 hundred dollar an hour job it should be me I is supposed yeah. to have that. So that's the entitlement that is in the system of white supremacy that you're running into. Now you can study everything you want to study and that's great and God bless you for it. But I, I study these people, I study the history all day long. It's classic right. what they do. I'm talking about those who are that way. I don't want to say everybody's that way, but those who are that way. That's why you're having the hiring practices problem. I don't disagree with you. I think I think it's beyond that. That's why I talked about the micro level, right? Mm -hmm. Because this this stuff is happening in the world. I mean, if you if you take a look at the stuff that's happening in the world, how do you prevent that from coming into the workplace? You can't. It's going to come to the workplace. We have to address it in the workplace the same way we do it on a micro, macro level. But here's my theory: what I'm responsible for and what I think that I can make impact for is helping create the allyship that. Let's just say it does exist, that there is that white entitlement and that there is that white privileges, right? How do we as minorities and the out group, let's just say, cause we're not in the in group, we're part of the out group. Um, how do we part of the out group continuously con try to do our efforts? So I, I'll, put it, I'll put it in a better way. I sat down with somebody from the Fred uh, Hutchinson Cancer Research and, you know, the conversation was about mountains. Like, I, I use the analogy of mountains. Like, dang, these are big mountains that we have to climb. These are big mountains that we have to climb. Look at all these obstacles, obstacles, obstacles. And one of the things, and I kind of, I, I'm kind of torn. Because one, one side of me says, um, well, you know, we do have these mountains. They are really real. We have to climb them. We talked about these mountains because, well, damn, we got to climb them. These, these are real. I mean, to, to, to say that the, the mountains don't exist is, is, is a lie. It, it, you know, we have to say the mountains exist. We're going to need help. We're going to need each other to climb these mountains. Or you could look at it and say, well, you know, in the meritocracy or somebody recently told me about this whole internal locus of control where if I don't, if I don't make it, it's my fault. I call bullshit on that. I think that's, that, I think that's false. Um, but there is the, the there are those people who are born in third base, acting like they hit a home run, talking about well, well anybody can be a, a, a superstar or baseball player, but we we dismiss the fact that the mountains that we have to climb just to get into the game, right? So we talk about well, hold on, how could you expect someone to be um, a, a computer science grad when we at an early age we don't even get them interested? or make it attractive or act, make them feel like they can to build what's next, right? Um, we don't give access to a computer. What does that path look like? How do we address those? So my work really initially started in STEM advocacy six years ago. Um, I, 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 I was working with someone that was talking about, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, and then, you know, out of a hundred high school kids in Washington state, only six will graduate with a STEM degree. However, you know, STEM is, is, is the highest demand, the job gaps and all that. And so I started my journey, not just personally, but really heavily more invested when I started learning about STEM advocacy and, 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 and the, the epidemic that's going to, that, that's going to happen. Um, so a couple of things that I've noticed that are really good for our, 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 you know, economic reasons is that there are, there are alternative methods to gain the skills needed. You don't have to go to a four-year degree. And that path to a four-year degree is easier for others than there are for others. So this is what I'm talking about the mountains again. Yes, can black and brown people graduate with a computer science degree? Yes. But if you go down to the south side of Seattle, what are the norms around there? What is the what is what is the, what is the, the statistics of somebody, you know, coming from Holly Park projects to be able to 
um, you know, get their computer science degree. Maybe there is no path and that pipeline is broken. How do we fix that pipeline? Let's address that, right? I'm not saying that the pipeline is not available. I'm saying that it, it, we can have a healthier pipeline, right? So, you know, looking at that pipeline and not dismissing that. So I think a lot of the, the reason why there's a disconnect and why there is that white privilege and why there is that, you know, the, 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 you know, the guilt or why people can turn, turn it on and off is because they don't know enough. They don't know enough. And, it, and we have to take this opportunity to um, broker those conversations with them. And that's what I do day in and day out. It's the most frustrating thing. I got to tell you, Phil, I mean, sitting across from somebody and trying to convince them that, hey, look, you know, if you just gave, you know, Shaquille O'Neal a basketball and let him shoot a couple shots, did you know that he could probably be a, an NBA star one day? You know, we talk about football. Isn't football such a great sport to watch now that you have black coaches, black quarterbacks? You know what I mean? Like, you got to give them that opportunity. And with that opportunity can come unpredictability based on what are, what we think is a norm, right? Um, and so I don't look at, I look at that as any anything else, anything different that we do, um, is that we can, can, can create a pipeline and an attraction piece and be aware and address those biases that exist Maybe we can start working towards more of a solution on both sides. Um, but going back to what you said, Phil, it's very real. The discrimination is very real. The higher up that I go, the more lack of understanding and a lost sense of reality that I see with some of these executives at these companies. And we can dismiss the fact and, 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 and turn away and say, well, you know, well, fuck you too. Um, or we can say, hey, we need to figure out how to create allyship here. We need to build bridges with these people. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the Trump supporters as well. You know, um, people that can use Trump administration and his presidency as a way to continue to mask or maybe be more open about the discrimination and, and their viewpoints, right? But it all goes back to, you know, on a micro level, we're dealing with, with this. I feel on a mi mi uh, micro, sorry, on a macro level and on, my, on a micro level in the workplace, in the pipeline, in the resources, I think we can impact some change over time and through that research and through that allyship. I think we can impact it because we're gonna need white allyship um, and get, have them understand their own privilege and their own power. The Harvard Business Review came out with a study and said that you know um, diversity and inclusion training has shown a backfire negative effect. Okay, that doesn't mean that, I, I, I personally doesn't mean that we should do away with that. I just mean that, okay, so, over the last couple of years that we've been trying to implement this training, it obviously has a sense of where white people are getting anxiety and they're saying it doesn't work or that they're that they're more biased now uh, because of it or you know this is just a check the box thing. But here are the other ways that it worked, and one of the other ways that, it, that these studies have shown is by creating this employee re, uh, resource groups, by creating the mentorship, by creating the strategic you know sourcing partnerships and community. Uh, engagement and, and that exposure. I think that, that that is our way towards moving towards the solution because I can sit here all day and talk about, you know, all the bad experiences and the civil rights reasons of why they should do the right thing. And I'll end it with this. When I was walking with one of my mentors, who's an African-American gentleman who, you know, rose in the early 90s to become a, a multimillionaire entrepreneur. Um, and he helped me think about my company in a, in a different way. And um, you know, I created my company based on a, what they call a blue ocean strategy, and I won't go into too, into too much, but basically a blue ocean strategy is talking about what is your niche in the, in the marketplace, you know, and what is this, the, 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 what is the service that you're providing that not anyone else can say that they can just, the minimum, the board of the entry is, is a little bit higher. So anyone can say they, they're, they own a staff and recruiting firm, but not everyone can say that they're committed and actually show the actions and the work behind their commitment to actually creating a more um, equitable, diverse, inclusive workplace and uh, hiring practices for companies. So when I created my company and we were walking um, uh, around a, a lake, he pointed at a, a multi-million dollar community that was across the water. He goes, let me ask you a question, Steve. He's like, um, I get you're very passionate and, uh, and uh, you know, you have a lot of emotions when you're talking about companies should just do the right thing. Since, you know, if companies should just do the right things, then you would be out of a job. 
you know, you the most chief diversity officers that serve on Fortune companies wouldn't have a role to play because companies just would just do the right thing. Well, what is the right thing? How do they know what that is when in their household maybe they can be taught the wrong things their whole entire life, right? Uh, you know, to stay away from Muslims, to stay away from Christians, or stay away from people that don't look like them. Um, you know, these things have not been eliminated in the household for a lot of majority of Americans, and it's, it's being played out. But he said if, if it was about the right things, and those people over there in Mercer Island with the multi-million dollar homes would be coming over here and donating to the south side of Seattle, because it's the right thing to do. He goes, the reason why that hasn't happened, Steve, because there's no motivating factor. You gotta understand, Steve, there's gotta be a business competitive strategic advantage for companies before they can actually make a move. And he said, it's not just about doing the right thing, it's about doing a smart business thing. And the more and more we can speak into their language for them to be for them to understand and effectively communicate the message, that's how we make, that's how we move the bar. That's how we get some real impact here. Otherwise, they'll continue to give us the lip service. They'll continue to talk about compliance and how they're just meeting the compliance. They'll talk about, you know, just the, you know, the, all the great things that they're doing, but there's no motivating factor. So how do you create that motivating factor for companies to move? And I believe I figured it out. I believe there's this thing called a hope of gain and a fear of loss. The fear of loss is the compliance. You know, that, and we, we, we've been on the fear of loss. We've been trying to pump fear into these companies they, and they still find ways to, 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 to discriminate, right? Because we're not really addressing the issue. We're just putting a band-aid fix on that. Well, Steve, I... Yeah, the, 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 I think the, the, the real way that we address the issue is talk about the business competitive advantage. And that's the hope of gain. The more we can focus on the hope of gains and a bottom line for companies, like for example, United, once you lose a billion dollars, that's gonna be what, what's gonna motivate you to start investing more into the hope of gain. Oh. Right? Uber, don't wait for compliance, don't wait for the fear of loss, don't wait for a, a, a lawsuit to do something. Be proactive about your engagements and your investments and in becoming more a diverse and inclusive work, workplace. That's how you prevent it. So um, I think that's the motivating factor for a lot of businesses because they, they, they're gonna shake their heads all day. They're gonna meet with civil rights leaders like Jesse Jackson and they're gonna produce skewed numbers and nothing changes because they don't know how to change their behavior. They didn't get the tools. They didn't get the training. They didn't get the resources. They didn't get the allies, the exposure, the engagement. That's my research and that's my 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 theory and what I want to introduce to corporate America and some of it's well received, some of it is not well received, and 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 the market will dictate that. So yeah, and like I say, before I wrap this up, I just want to say just just a few things. Um, first first and foremost, all, all the stuff that you're dealing with, like I say, God bless you. That's why I push uh, people in our community to create your own businesses. That way, you ain't got to deal with that. Number two, yeah. when it comes to these companies, okay. The only thing they respect is the dollar. And if you was to tell them, look, okay, Facebook, you won't hire no black people, brown people, Asian people, fine. We don't have, we don't, don't hire them. But we're going we gonna to close our accounts. We're going to delete your app. Because the only thing they respond to is money. That's it. Like Martin Luther King showed us how to do it. If they don't do what you say, hit them in the pocketbook. All of a sudden, they'd be hiring every application that came in there. Talking about, oh, hey, we, we, you're a good candidate because they lost money. You know, so, and you mentioned Jesse Jackson. I'm like, oh God. You know, they, they call certain civil rights leaders in to pacify people too. Um, see, that's why they couldn't call me in there because I'm like, look, you either do what we say or you don't have to. Uh, we're going to just boycott you. And then that way you don't want to hire somebody then. You know, yeah, I so. I, you know what? I agree with you there. In, in the words of a Reed who, who runs a um, Floodgate Academy, which is a a uh, free coding program for African-American males. And I respect this gentleman dearly. Mm -hmm. He says, Steve, I've been in, in enough executive meetings and boardrooms that, and I don't want to discourage you, Steve. I want you to keep doing the work that you do. But let me tell you what's going to happen. 
They're going to sit across from you. They're going to say, diversity, inclusion. Yes, 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 it sounds good. And they're going to look over to their finance department or their VP of sales and say, how's the sales numbers doing? Good? We still making money? Stock's still going good? Sounds good to me. What were you saying about diversity again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. Right. Diversity sounds good. We'll get back to you. This sounds good. You know, we're doing a lot for women. We're doing a lot for veterans. And I get that, that a lot. And I always challenge that a little bit because um, I believe that it's a behavioral thing. And I think based on behavioral, it just takes more education, cultural awareness, exposure, you know, t inviting them to the communities, bringing the communities to their workplace, letting them know that there are black and brown people that qualify for these jobs. Um, and, 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 and that's, and that, I think through that is where we're going to find some solution and some, some progress. Well, Steve, that's, that's, that's where it's going it, to, that's, I, I'm seeing it play out in real time and I hope to get more data and capture on this, but our last event, we had over close to 200 people for the first time. People got to engage with the Seattle Police Department. Some, a person that looked like them. There was a black police officer that came out there and a woman police officer that came out there and engaged with the communities. You know, we had community leaders come out and show their support and lend their support and become the voice of, 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 of many that they represent. We had companies that came out to say, hey, we're beyond the lip service, we're here. We want to sh let you know we're here. We want to listen. We want to understand what can we do better. I think yeah. that dialogue, that conversation, that creates opportunity, that presents discussion, that keeps it going, right? I'm not here to do fancy uh, galas, which that works too, but I'm here to talk about real engagement, real work, real discussions, transparency, and there's going to be times where we offending one another. But through that offense, there's opportunity for us to continue to grow and work towards something. Because we can't do this alone. We can't. I want to thank you for joining us uh, on the show today. Uh, where can people find you if they want to continue the conversation with you? Yes, please. Find me on LinkedIn. It's Stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N, Matley, M-A-T-L-Y. Uh, my email is Stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N, at S-M, my initials diversity.com uh, our website and our job opportunities that we um, are constantly updating is smdiversity.com uh, i am proud to say that we personally as a company um, have uh, black brown white women uh, different you know uh, sexual orientation uh, we've had vets you know in, in our organization i'm so happy that our our leading recruiters are both women from diverse backgrounds uh, who work work at home that were trying to figure out a way to return to the workplace. And we, women that were not from our industry that we trained um, and now are providing uh, residual revenue income streams into their household to us and to me every day I wake up, that's, that's my way of impacting the world. That's my way of impacting diversity and inclusion. Um, that's my way of, of creating that progress that if we don't see it, we can go build it. And, you know, that's, this is our give back. Um, you know, every, we, we do tons of events, uh, Phil, and we, we hope that interviews like this and platforms like this, and we want to thank you, uh, Phil, and the advice show for giving us a platform to continue to, to lend our voices and our experience and, and continue the dialogue. And anyone that's out there that can lend some feedback, some thoughts, some research, some 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 debate. Maybe we're doing it wrong. Tell us tell us why what what what's wrong. Um, what can we take into consideration? This is learning and growth opportunities. This is still groundbreaking right now. This is a time that's also good for change and solutions. So please do not be discouraged to reach out to me. I am available. Um, SMDiversity.com. Email me. LinkedIn me. Facebook me. Um, you know I will do my best to respond in a timely manner. Uh, I, again, once again, thank you, Advice Show, Phil, uh, Kellen, uh, uh, Kel Kellen Coleman PR for, for setting this up. Um, I hope that we can continue to grow our networks, grow our communities, and stand united and, and let people know that we have enough influence.
we have enough talent. We are here, and we will continue to grow, and um, we're going to keep knocking. Uh, but I think, Phil, one of the things that will happen is if we keep getting ignored, those doors will get kicked down eventually. And so I'm hopeful that we can do this in a peaceful manner. Um, uh, but I think that the, the, the pressure is on where a lot of people are feeling that being enough is enough. Being left out is, is, is not a good feeling. And, and as long as we can work towards solutions and if these solutions get supported by these companies and they understand the value of it, that if we could be a customer, we could be a candidate, um, I, I'm hopeful. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you what's gonna happen in the next three to five years, but pressure's on for a lot of companies. Change needs to happen fast. All right. With, with that said, definitely want to thank, you know, Steve for coming on the show and uh, make sure you guys, you know, contact him if you want to continue the uh, conversation further. Um, everything that he said in this uh, video today is just reiterating some points and I'm going to push him a little bit harder now just because everything he's telling me that he's dealing with. So uh, thank you guys for watching and see you next time.